Luna Park, Sydney. This amusement park has become an icon of Sydney's famous harbour, but it has such an up and down and tumultuous history, and so much has happened over the past almost century that have meant that Luna Park could very well have not been standing here today. We could describe it as the classic Aussie battler. So this is the history of Luna Park, Sydney. The story of Luna Park, Sydney actually begins over a thousand kilometres away. While the original Luna Park in Australia opened in St Kilda in Melbourne in 1912, another opened in Glenelg in Adelaide, South Australia in 1930. Luna Park Glenelg operated in the seaside town until a dispute between the owners and the council over rent and profitability caused the owners to look elsewhere for their amusement park operations. On the 8th of April 1935, the Glenelg Park closed for good and the assets were put up for auction. They would eventually be purchased by Luna Park Glenelg's owners David Atkins and Herman Phillips. Along with fellow owner Ted Hopkins, they began to search for a new location to reopen their Luna Park. Meanwhile in Sydney, construction on the Sydney Harbour Bridge had been completed in 1932, leaving a very large site in Milsons Point which was previously home to workshops, cranes and railway sidings completely empty. North Sydney Council was seeking expressions of interest to develop the land, and in 1934 Herman Phillips would win the tender with the lease starting on the 11th of September 1935. Immediately after Luna Park Glenelg went into liquidation, the owners snapped up all the rides and assets and relocated to Sydney. The reassembly of all the rides and the construction of the new park would all occur at a cost of around £60,000, reopening on the 4th of October 1935, almost immediately to resounding numbers and success. The original Luna Park operated from 1935 to 1979, and it would not only establish itself as a family favourite attraction, but also establish several icons that have become symbolic of Luna Park and of Sydney as a whole. First of all, the large entry face. It's placed between two Art Deco towers inspired by New York's Chrysler building, and it became an icon of the park, very similar to the one at Luna Park Melbourne. It has had eight different iterations in the park's history. Also, the Big Dipper, the original park's signature attraction. A wooden roller coaster constructed to an American design and relocated from the park in Glenelg. It was an opening day attraction and it operated right through until the park's original closure in 1979. There was also the Rotor, inspired by a ride at the 1951 Festival of Britain. It opened at Luna Park in the 1950s and a version has remained at the park almost to this day. There was Coney Island, named after the original Luna Park in Brooklyn. It's a 1930s era funhouse which has been preserved and remains at the park to this day. And there was the Wild Mouse, a Hopkins wooden wild mouse which opened in the 1950s, originally relocating between Luna Park and the Sydney showgrounds, but now permanently on site at Luna Park. Luna Park was quickly a Sydney institution and a huge success. It originally operated only during the summer months and closed in winter for annual maintenance of all of its attractions. In 1970, Ted Hopkins and Art Barton, the original operators of the park, retired and left ownership to a consortium named World Trade Center PTY Ltd. World Trade Center had applied to demolish the park and construct an international trade center consisting of seven high-rise buildings, but the application was quickly rejected by the New South Wales government, and World Trade Center instead opted to continue operating the amusement park, which was now open year-round. However, in 1975, Luna Park's lease expired and negotiations for renewal began with the New South Wales government. This is where the first signs of trouble would begin for Luna Park. In 1976, Neville Rann was elected Premier of New South Wales and suddenly lease negotiations ground to a halt. Meanwhile, World Trade Centre, who originally didn't want to operate the amusement park in the first place, were not too keen on renewing the lease anyway and didn't pursue it any further. The park was allowed to continue operating beyond the expiry of its lease, but its future was uncertain. In protest, the Art Gallery of New South Wales held an exhibition highlighting the importance and heritage of Luna Park, but to no avail. With the lease negotiations causing trouble, the final nail in the coffin for the original Luna Park would come with its most disastrous year in 1979. On the 16th of April that year, a steel runner came loose on the park's signature attraction, the Big Dipper. One of the roller coasters trains came to a halt and a second train collided with it, injuring 13 riders. 
Then, just months later, even greater tragedy would occur. On the 9th of June, the park's ghost train caught fire in what has since been described as suspicious circumstances. The fire quickly engulfed the ride, which was understaffed and not adequately covered by the park's fire containment systems. Fire crews managed to contain the fire before it spread to nearby attractions, but the ghost train was completely destroyed, and in the rubble, the bodies of six children and one adult were uncovered. Luna Park was immediately closed. While the fire was originally attributed to an electrical fault, these circumstances have since come under question. Since this is the topic of ongoing investigation, I won't make any allegations in this video, but I would highly recommend watching the documentary series on the ABC, which explores the fire and its strange links to Sydney's criminal underbelly. At the end of July 1979, before proper investigations had even been completed, the New South Wales government called for new tenders for the land that Luna Park stood on. These applications would continue into early 1980, and a community group called the Friends of Luna Park would stage protests, marches, concerts, and more events to try to save Luna Park. In the end, they were successful, but at a cost. The Luna Park face was listed as an item of national heritage in June 1981, saving it from demolition, but the rest of the park was only given recorded heritage status. The park came under the new ownership of Cole Goldstein, and many of its classic rides were torn down without a second thought. The Big Dipper, the River Caves, and many others would be torn down and auctioned off at bargain prices. The entire River Caves ride was bought by the Friends of Luna Park for just $20. The Friends of Luna Park raised money to buy what they could from the auctions and prepared a conservation plan to preserve and salvage whatever they possibly could from the original park. Meanwhile, however, the tender for the land itself had fallen to a company called Australian Amusement Associates. After a final auction of everything detachable, anything that was not sold was bulldozed and burned, with the exception of the face, the Crystal Palace, and Coney Island. Australian Amusement Associates rebuilt the park, but due to a dispute with the previous owners, were forced to rename it to Harborside Amusement Park. The park, now devoid of its original Luna Park charm and any of its original attractions, reopened in 1982. It would operate for just six years. The new owners quickly ran into disputes with the Department of Public Works, and one director became the subject of an inquiry by the Corporate Affairs Commission. In April of 1988, reports from independent engineers stated that several rides in the park were not safe for operation and needed to be shut down for renovations and repairs. The park closed again, this time seemingly indefinitely. By the end of 1989, the owners had made no effort to make the required renovations and repairs, and the amusement park stood rotting. Meanwhile, the New South Wales government was receiving several submissions to replace the land with high-rise apartments, and the government issued an ultimatum. Open the park by the start of June 1990, or lose the lease. Still, the owners did next to nothing. Several dormant rides were moved around to give the appearance of ongoing works, but when the park had not reopened by the 4th of June 1990, the lease was terminated, and a reserve trust was established to take over ownership of the park. Thankfully, despite intense interest in demolishing the park and redeveloping the land, the government thought better of the idea, gazetting the Luna Park Site Act of 1990, which protects the site and dedicates it for amusement and recreation. This made the park just the second amusement park in the world to be protected by government legislation, the first being Copenhagen's Tivoli Gardens. In 1991, a $25 million grant was given for redevelopment of the park, and the works were given the green light. It looked like Luna Park was coming back. This would be the largest redevelopment in the park's history up to that point, including the demolition of former North Shore railway sidings to expand the park's footprint, the renovation of the park's heritage icons and artworks, and the construction of several new attractions, including a second iteration of the Big Dipper, a 40 metre aerodynamics looping coaster. However, the Big Dipper would be at the centre of another failure for Luna Park's history. When the park finally reopened in January of 1995, poor weather caused low attendance, leading to less than anticipated profits. Meanwhile, legal claims were made by nearby residents about the noise pollution caused by the Big Dipper, forcing its operating hours to be restricted. With poor attendance and its flagship attraction being crippled by legal claims, the park closed on the 14th of February 1996 after just over a year back in operation. They were forced to close yet again, going into administration. Even though the park itself was now protected by law, it didn't look promising for Luna Park. This time, the New South Wales government under Premier Bob Carr said that applications to reopen or redevelop the park would not be considered, meaning the park stood dormant with no prospects of reopening. 
However, after vocal grassroots support, including a petition launched by local high school students, four applications for redevelopment went under consideration. Meanwhile, Luna Park was briefly permitted to operate under strict court-ordered conditions for a few charity events, as well as on selected weekends and school holidays in 2000 and 2001. However, its flagship attraction, the New Big Dipper, would be sold to Dreamworld on the Gold Coast and disassembled in 2001. Out of the four redevelopment applications, the one selected was by a company called Metro Edgeley, who intended for the majority of the rides and park to remain as it was, but for the Big Dipper to be replaced with a 2,000-seat multi-purpose concert venue named The Big Top. After consultations with North Sydney Council and agreements with local residents, the redevelopment began in 2003. Over 14 months, rides were restored and renovated to comply with modern safety standards and it would reopen, along with its new stadium venue, on the 4th of April 2004. This time, despite poor weather again hampering the opening weeks, several thousand would attend the opening day and over a quarter of a million guests would visit within two months. Noise concerns would again be raised in 2005. But after a brutal and controversial court battle, the Supreme Court of New South Wales dismissed the claims in February 2009, and legislation was passed by the New South Wales government protecting Luna Park from such claims in the future. And since then, Luna Park has flourished. As well as the restoration of classic attractions such as Coney Island, the Wild Mouse and the Rota, the new Luna Park features an iconic ferris wheel, carousel, a 50 metre drop tower named the Hair Razor, and several other classic boardwalk style amusement attractions. And in 2021, the park's largest redevelopment in history saw nine new rides, including three roller coasters installed. This includes the third iteration of the Big Dipper, this time a much quieter and lower profile ride, the world's first Interman Hot Racer, a single rail launch coaster with a top speed of 75 kilometers an hour. Today, the park is emblematic of Sydney. Despite its troubled history, Luna Park has remained, and today it is as popular as ever. One of the world's only heritage amusement parks offering views that you'll be lucky to get in any other park in the world, it is an institution of Sydney, and almost as iconic as the bridge that it stands right next to. What are your memories of the old days of Luna Park? Have you tried out the new attractions? Let me know your thoughts on both in the comments below. If you like this video, consider giving it a like and subscribing to see future videos, and of course click the bell icon to be notified when I next upload. Don't forget to subscribe to my football and weekly vlog channels, links are in the description. I hope to see you all in the next video, have a lovely week.